Analysis of I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud by William Wordsworth A truly romantic poem, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, is an appreciation of nature for the impact it has on man. In previous analyses, we looked at the conflict between man and nature. In this poem, we'll get to explore the profoundly positive impact that nature has on man, and how a connection with nature is one of the most important bonds a human being can ever form. Welcome back to Between the Lines. To begin, we'll read the poem. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. Beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze, continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft when I on my couch lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. A simple simile in the opening line compares the speaker to a cloud. Much like a lone cloud that drifts aimlessly across the sky, the speaker wandered lonely. Wander here opens the poem to several directions. Our speaker might be literally taking a stroll through the fields, walking with no destination in mind. Perhaps he strolls absent-mindedly. He might be daydreaming or pondering about something. Wandering also means going astray, straying from one's set course. This feeling that we are wandering through life is not a strange one. Not only is the speaker wandering, but he is lonely. Perhaps there is no one to set him straight or remind him of his course. Even so, the speaker isn't really lonely, in that there is some connection between him and nature. At the very least, he shares a common trait with clouds, aimlessness. As said in line 2, the cloud that the speaker is like is one that floats high over vales and hills. These vales and hills are perhaps the ups and downs of life, the highs and the lows. Even with the balance of good and bad times, the speaker still does not have a sense of direction or purpose. As the speaker walks boredly or purposelessly, the soft consonants of L over the first two lines provide a lazy lulling sound. Listen to the consonants. I wander lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills. Most of the lines throughout the poem are end stopped, but line one is enjammed, making way for line two to run into it seamlessly, adding to that aimless, haphazard feeling. In the next two lines, the speaker's loneliness is starkly interrupted as he sees a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. In line one, the speaker was compared to a cloud through a simile. Now, instead of man being compared to nature, the reverse happens, as the daffodils are personified into being a crowd, which of course is a collective noun that refers to people. Going further, the daffodils are said to be a host, which elevates them even further, now comparing them to angels in this subtle metaphor. The daffodils do not emerge lazily and incrementally. They are not slow and aimless like the clouds. Instead, they burst forth into being. Look at all at once in line 3. The speaker seems to be startled by the daffodils. The assonated vowel sounds over lines 3 and 4 contrast with the lazy L's from earlier on. Listen. When all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, the repeated O oh and AH sounds, those are the sounds of the speaker's amazement, as well as the rich sound of the crowd of daffodils. They are made through the assonance to sound like a bellowing choir, an angelic host perhaps. The imagery of the rich sound works well with the imagery in golden. We can see a sea of golden daffodils dancing together in their angelic majesty. In the next line, we can imagine our speaker spinning and looking about, delightedly shocked to see the daffodils everywhere he looks. He sees them beside the lake and beneath the trees. Suddenly, the daffodils are everywhere. 
The Sozura in the middle of the line shows us the speaker's movements and pauses as he notices the golden flowers everywhere. Also, it positions the reader to see the daffodils beside the lake and then under the trees. It gives the effect of the daffodils popping up wherever one looks. In line 6, the daffodils are fluttering and dancing in the breeze. We actually get two different images from fluttering and dancing. The personification of flowers dancing in the breeze is a very familiar one. This time though, we can imagine countless golden flowers, a choir of angelic daffodils dancing in unison. Such a mighty and majestic movement. In the dancing, we can enjoy not only the ubiquity of nature, but also the unison, the order of nature. Imagine 10,000 flowers dancing together. Such coordination, such synchronicity. But then we get to fluttering, which is quite a different imagery. Fluttering is a rapid, irregular movement, often caused by a strong breeze. So we see both the beautiful order of nature and the beautiful chaos of nature. This magnificent emergence and blinding presence of daffodils is displayed even by the poem's form in line 6. All along, the iambic tetrameter is maintained, but then when fluttering appears, the word disrupts the rhythm, and fluttering forces three syllables where two should be. This is a part of the beautiful chaos I mentioned earlier. Listen to the meter as I read stanza 1. I wander lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Still looking at meter, continuous in line 7 gives us an extra syllable, the word itself continues for too long, bringing brilliant emphasis to the word's meaning. Here, through simile, the daffodils are compared to the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. Certainly, hyperbole is in play. Just as the stars of the galaxy are never-ending, or seemingly so, so the daffodils seem to be numberless. We see so much luminous imagery in shine and twinkle. Not only do we get the visual imagery in the shining and twinkling, but we get the corresponding sonic imagery. We can not only see but hear the twinkling. The interplay between the consonated s and assonated i sounds are like the flashes of light, the flickers of dark and light and of various colors. Listen again to lines 7 and 8. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. The enjambment between the lines serve to underscore this continuity. The speaker continues to provide hyperbole in the next two lines, seeing the flowers stretched in a never-ending line along the margin of a bay. As far as the speaker's eyes can see, the golden daffodils are a border that stretches infinitely alongside the water. The hyperbole continues as the speaker claims to see 10,000 daffodils with just a single glance. These flowers, which are all in a line, are tossing their heads in sprightly dance. This is more personification. The flower's dance is one of vim and vigor, a vibrant and illustrious display of nature. As if fearing being outdone, the waves beside the flowers start dancing too. Remember, the flowers were bordering a bay. Even though the waves danced, they were no match for the daffodils, which outdid the sparkling waves in glee. The point of the dancing daffodils and waves is not in the personification of nature, but in the speaker's perception of nature as being joyful. This joyousness and harmony in the natural world are in direct contrast to the speaker's original mood. Remember, in the beginning he was wandering aimlessly, he was lonely. It is important to stop and note that within nature we can find both order and chaos, both joy and sorrow, both purpose and aimlessness. The speaker in the beginning was aimless, but his aimlessness was compared to that of a cloud, an element of nature. Now, other elements of nature are gleeful. Perhaps as humans, we must be selective in which elements of nature we bond with and even emulate. The speaker has no choice but to rejoice with nature, but to give in to the joy of the natural world. Being gay, being joyous, merry, is a natural result from observing and interacting with nature. When one finds themselves in such jocund or such jolly company, they will automatically absorb that joy. It is a little curious that the speaker narrows the representation of himself to poet instead of a more general term like one or someone. 
It might mean that only poets can perceive and assimilate the joys of nature. Perhaps it is a little more general. Maybe only those with a sort of poetic or romantic sense, those with a finer perception, can recognize and ingest the joys of nature. In the next line, the speaker is said to have gazed and gazed. The hyphens, along with the repetition, do well to emphasize how long he gazed for. Yet even after gazing for so long, he did not understand the significance of this moment. He could not grasp what wealth the show of daffodils had brought him. Wealth ties back to golden in stanza one. This experience with nature was worth more than gold, more than money. While he did see the display of nature as something wonderful, its real value would dawn on him only later. In the last stanza, we shift from recounting a memory to dealing with the present. The mood described in vacant and pensive is reminiscent of the wandering mood the poem opened with. Often, when the speaker lies on his couch joylessly, it is that display of nature, that display of the daffodils, that floods his mind and fills him with joy. The daffodils flash upon his inward eye, upon his mind, and this memory makes his solitude blissful. Look at how diction works to show us two different shades of meaning. In line one, the speaker wandered lonely. This word has a negative connotation. When one is lonely, company is lacking. Loneliness is a lack of something. Now this loneliness changes to solitude, a word with a similar meaning but a very different connotation. Solitude is a much more positive word. In these moments of solitude, the speaker remembers the daffodils and his heart is filled with pleasure. His heart can dance with the daffodils. It is this oneness with nature and even the memory of first recognizing nature that brings joy to the speaker. Let's briefly look at the poem's form. We see 24 lines divided into four sestets. The first three stanzas are in past tense as the speaker reflects on the memory of first noticing the daffodils. The last stanza is in the present tense as he continues in his daily life to reap the benefits of that epiphany, of that first encounter. We have a rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, C, C, which each stanza follows. The poem almost perfectly adheres to the iambic tetrameter. This almost strict maintenance of meter reminds us of the coordinated dance of the daffodils. The meter is broken at lines 6's fluttering and line 12's tossing. In each instance, the breakage signifies the swift movement of the flowers. That is it guys, those are my 10 cents on this wonderful poem. If this video helped you to reach a clearer understanding of the poem, then please give it a like so other students, teachers, and poetry enthusiasts can find it more easily. I do one analysis video per week, so if that sounds like something you'd want to keep up with, be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell. See you soon.